21st century woman is leaning into the rich, complex, diverse and dynamic um, reality of womanhood. And Yolanda Mia is no different. This is a woman who's transitioned from corporate finance into running a family-owned property investment business. So today, we're going to explore and go on an adventure with Yolanda Mia and discover what does it take to transition and to pivot in terms of her career, as well as how does she view balance in terms of motherhood, career, and doing life and living holistically. Good to be Have here. Have you really today? I'm so looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you for making time in your schedule for us. I know you're extremely busy. I am, but you know what? I would never pass this opportunity to be driven by you. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to the day. So this is not the first time we have you on Art of Super Woman. Uh, we actually interviewed you last year, September, um, at African Odyssey. Correct, correct. But what we didn't get into is the formative years of Yolanda. Oh, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about who is Yolanda? Where does she come from? What was her childhood like? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, gosh, I had a very interesting childhood actually. Um, so I was brought up by my grandparents. I grew up in Guamashu. I don't know if you, I'm sure you've heard yes. of Guamashu in KZN. And it's very different now, I have to say, to mm -hmm. how it was then. Um, but I mean, I think on the whole, I, I had a really happy childhood. We were, there were five of us, my cousins and, uh, and I, and we were all, you know, our parents were doing various things. My mom was in the arts in Johannesburg. My dad was an entrepreneur. So I guess it made sense then to be, you know, brought up by, by our grandparents. And mm. so I actually called my grandmother, mommy. Okay. Yeah. And we lived in this house, which at the time I really felt that it was more than sufficient. I mean, we, there were five of us in this little room and we <laughs> slept there and we had more than enough space. But every time I visit now, I'm like, what? How did I How fit did in here? <laughs> I, I get the same thing. Yeah. How on earth did we fit in there? But it was a, it, it was a lovely community, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we got involved in, in, in community events. You know, we got partici I participated in beauty contests, soccer, uh -huh. you know, competitions. <laughs> so it, it was really a very different place to what it is today very happy memories and um, I, I think you know the one thing I, I, I when I reflect now is like we actually didn't really have that much but I don't really remember lacking anything mm. so it, it, I had a very very lovely upbringing um, you know loving um, childhood and very interactive very communal and I think that's where my passion really for the community came from yeah yeah and not just community I think also family you're so big on yeah. family you know oh, yeah. was it being brought up in that kind of environment that made you always yearn to keep family around yeah absolutely I mean as I said there were five of us and um, I, I was an only child for nine years by the way so oh, wow. and over those years um, my cousins were really my, my brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and so that's kind of half grown up you know my aunts are like my mom's my grandmother was my mom um, my you know so so I really came um, through a family that really did put you know, family first and uh, being there for each other. And that's never changed. And I'm really grateful for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I really am very grateful for it, yeah. What are some of your earliest, most precious memories that you carry and that always just live on and just make you smile? What's that yeah. memory, childhood memory that just makes you smile? Oh, yeah. There's so many really, but um, you know, the one, that thing, the one thing I remember, and actually now with, now that we've got load shedding and this generator <laughs> thing is that at, at, for a long time in Wamashu, they actually didn't have electricity, unlike ah, Soweto. Yes. Um, so we used um, candles and used generators. Mm. But we were fortunate enough that my mom, you know, from Joburg, she'd make money and send money home. Mm. And we bought this little black and white TV, which <laughs> we had, and you know, twice a week, my grandfather would like, start the generator going. <laughs> And then in a bit, you know, in a few minutes, we'd have the whole neighborhood sitting in our veranda, Aww. and we'd all sit there and just watch watch TV, and it was just so communal and real Ubuntu, and um, yeah, I mean that, that that's one memory that's quite I'm, I'm quite fond of. And my mom was in the arts, and she actually used to be on the TV, so especially when she was, you know, I think uh, there was a show called uh, For Zoom. Yes. And whenever that was on, you know, the whole community would come, we'd sit in the veranda, it would be beautiful, hot, sunny days in Durban, and we'd, and we'd watch TV. And yes. it was just, it was just so communal. Oh. That, that's a very fun memory that always comes to mind. And one, what is that scent that always reminds you of home? So, 
I had a grandmother who had hands, magical hands, and anything she touched literally came to life. Yes. Um, you know, as I said, whenever I go home now, I don't know how any of this was there, but I kid you not, we had mango tree, we mm -hmm. had an orange tree, we had banana tree, we had granadilla, we had pawpaw, Hectic. we had, and we even had a little chicken farm. So anything organic that is homegrown, anything that is fresh, you know, um, always reminds me of that because we literally live off our little, you know, home and that garden and my grandmother really got so much out of it. So whenever I go to a fresh, you know, oh. uh, vegetable shop or store, it always reminds me of home because my grandmother created that around us. Oh, that's, I think that's a big similarity that we have because my grandmother was big on living off her land. Yeah. Big yeah. on waking us up early in the morning. She'd always say, you need to pick the veggies yeah. early in the morning before yeah. they wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we'd yeah. go into the garden and pick those ve fresh veggies from her backyard. But did young Yolanda always know she'd be such a powerhouse? Such a, a powerhouse. big shot, such a, like, you know, a corporate giant into entrepreneurial giant. Did you always know that? Look, I, I one thing I knew is that I would never fail at whatever I did. Mm. So I think I think a part of me has always been very deliberate about every decision I've taken, and I knew from a very long time, from a very young age, that I wanted to be not only financially dependent but mm. actually be dependable by my or my family. I always wanted to be a solution in some shape or form. So. Mm. I mean, I remember, uh, I, I, would, I think you're much younger than I am, but I think those days, um, I, I, I grew up, I went to local school. So for, for class A, class B, and a one, two, and three, which is now, I guess, up to what, grade five, five I think, yeah. Yes. I went to a local school because those days you couldn't actually go to multiracial school. And even though it had it, it, very little to offer, in whatever it did offer, I, I, I always thrived. I used to make sure I came first in class. I used to... Whatever sport they offered, you know, uh, whether it was soccer mm. or hockey, whatever it is, I made sure that I thrived. And I, I, I knew then that I, I wanted to become someone. But I think the inflection point for me really came when um, I had this incredible opportunity to go to a private school. And and how it came about is that my best friend at the time um, came from a very wealthy family. She came uh, to school the one day and she had uh, a pamphlet, okay. uh, application form for the school. And, I remember looking at this pamphlet thinking to myself, this cannot be real. You know, you saw these luscious gardens, oh. big pool, big tennis courts. I was like, this does not exist. And I said, you know what, Agnes, you have to get your parents to get me forms. Oh. Parents got the forms, filled in the forms myself. I was 10 years old at the time, forged my parents' signature. Agnes' parents submitted my forms with, the, with Agnes' forms were invited to write an entrance exam. My parents knew nothing about it, by the way. Wow. My grandmother, I remember her emptying her bank account to give me the entrance fee money. Oh. <laughs> you know, we wrote the exam and lo and behold, Agnes didn't get it and I did. Wow. And for me, that opportunity just completely changed my outlook in life and what was actually possible. And I think for me, that inflection point was 1991. I knew that whatever, wherever I end up, it has to be impactful it has to yes. be big you know i have to break breaks themselves give an opportunity that most women wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten so yeah I, I guess in a way i think that was my inflection point and i had the right environment to, to really make sure that i i used the opportunity that I was given from did that you know that experience did it ever create in you the you know this pressure to be better to push on because obviously, as a as a young black woman at the age of ten, mm. filling in those forms, cleaning out your grandmother's bank account for her to be able to send you into a private school like that mm. must have induced this idea of I have no choice but to excel. Mm. Mm. You, you know, you're so right because I think every time I had conversations with my with my dad, who literally would you know had to sell his liver to put me through the school. Uh, it being a private school, I, I would feel that pressure. But I think on the whole, any pressure that I've, I've, I've put on my, I've, I've had is really from being my, from myself. And most of the time, I actually have such 
surety in, it, in everything that I do because I always go the extra length of making sure that I'm properly prepared for it to actually work out. So mm. I don't think I was feeling that, oh my God, I've got pressure. To, I just knew that it's going to work out. I mm. knew that I was going to excel. I knew that I would get that job. I knew that I would get into the universe. I knew I'd study this. I knew I'd pass it because yes. I, I knew what I needed to do to get there. Mm. You know, life is really about preparation. So, yes, there was pressure from, you know, my dad every now and then. But I think on the whole, um, the, the, the pressure was probably, um, you know, exerted by myself or myself. But yes. also I, I, I was quite comfortable with it because I knew that I knew what I needed to do to make it work. I like that you're saying I knew what I needed to do to get there. I knew that um, there were, so there were steps that you needed to take mm. to be able to achieve your dreams and to be able to get to where you are. It wasn't just about the mindset of I need to get there. Mm. I need to do that and allowing that pressure to lead. Mm. Do you think that's the mistake we sometimes make as women in that when we think about the glass ceiling or we think about excelling and things, we always kind of assume it's just about, you know, let me just think my way through it as opposed to what more measurable steps do I need to take to get there? You know, you're spot on already because this is a conversation I have all the time when people talk about what does success look like. And I say for me, you know, success is not a, it's not an ultimate um, you know, location or mm. a journey I'm trying to get to. It's daily, mm. you know. Uh, we forget to count our daily successes, you know, and counting and being appreciative of the, of the small wins. Um, you know, everything is really a means to some end, mm. but don't forget about those means and everything that you have to do daily. So I, I've always been very good at, at not, I, I know that ultimately I, I, the impact I need to make, but in getting there, each step is, you have to be present mm. at, at every moment, you know. Getting into that school for me was a massive achievement. I had to pat myself on the back. Um, you know, learning how to swim, I got there, I didn't even know how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> learning how to swim was a massive achievement. You know, eventually, and eventually I found myself and now I'm in the first team this, first mm. team that, but it, it wasn't was because I went and it was more, small, measurable, and, and one has to be present in those moments, because sometimes, you know, the thing is, if you're trying to get there and you feel like you're not getting there, you're completely demotivated. Yes, yes. So th there's, there's an element of me of saying, okay, I know I'll get there. I definitely know I'll get there. But along the way, it won't, you know, you need to be dynamic and, and very agile in how you move around it. But you also got to be present and actually count those small wins on, on, on route. The journey is as important as, as, as actually the ultimate prize that you're trying to get to. Wow. And I think we sometimes look at it as, oh, to jump from corporate into the family business, oh wow, it was inevitable. Yeah. But there is so much planning, yeah. there is so much learning, and we take for granted yeah. what it takes to be an entrepreneur in South oh Africa. My goodness. And that there is that corporate training that is needed. There is yeah. also that on the ground, those hours you need to oh put into yeah. um, building up what the main vision is and what the big vision is. Yeah. You don't just become a successful entrepreneur. Yeah. Overnight. And in actual fact, my father, who um, now I've learned more about why he took certain decisions now that he's passed and mm. I appreciate it more because we used to fight about these things a lot but do you know he I always wonder why he waited so long to ask me to join mm. I always felt like I mean I can do this but actually timing is everything and, yes. and, and his timing was absolutely perfect so again with, with that in mind it's like it's not it, there wasn't an entitlement to, mm. to work for the family business he had to be comfortable that I was ready that I had the right skills, but that I was ready, you know, I was mature enough to be in that position. So it's, it's also not just, it wasn't ever about me saying, and now I'm just, I'm ready to go. Yes. But he also had to see me worthy of that responsibility. Um, so I had to absolutely do the groundwork um, sure. to get there. And on that note, I think we're arriving at our adventure. Oh yeah. We will talk about and unpack the dynamics of a family business and oh. you as a mom and balancing all those things, if there's such a thing. Um, <laughs> just after our adventure. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and this, this is Lingani, he's also a manager, so I'm okay. going to hand you over to him because he's the professional. <laughs> Thank Great. you, Lingani. Before I say anything, I want to know from you guys, is it first time to do this or have done this before? First time. First time, first time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little bit nervous, yes. I won't lie. <laughs> don't try, don't try. Okay, uh, let me quickly show you how to okay. uh, do this and then I'll take you out. Thank you. Let me start with the steering. Mm -hmm. It's more like a basco. You have to uh, push and pull using your muscles. If you want to turn to your right, you pull your right hand and push and pull. There uh -huh. we go. As you can see, only my muscles are working, not the whole body. Other people are stressing their, themselves. But it looks cool. Sometimes it's easier to lose control. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about brakes uh, for stopping the bike. Check this guy, it's a brake, this guy's a brake. Also there, there's a foot brake. Okay. Mm, okay. So I should do three brakes. I'm not saying you can use uh, three of them at once. No, no, no. <laughs> These guys are there to stop the bike. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Their duty is to stop the bike. So remember, if you are using this brake, you are braking front wheels. This one and, and that one, they're all rear brake. And then check uh, about the 40 brake. It's a parking brake, more like a hand brake. On top is written parking. And then that's on, that's off. Mm -hmm. So right now the bike is parked. Mm -hmm. Before we go, uh, Riz so is going to help you to take the hand brake off. So you come this side. That's off. If you okay. want to park, you go like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then if you are riding, please don't use the handbrake to stop the bike. <laughs> yes, normally <laughs> it happens. So don't. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. Right, let's talk about the uh, uh, speed control. We'll be talking about the accelerator. Okay. Right, um, that's the accelerator. Use your, your thumb. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know you guys are driving cars, you are always using your, your, your foot. Yes. So here you are using your thumb. But okay. the operation is the same. Mm -hmm. The more you press it, the faster it goes. Mm -hmm. If you want to brake, you take off your thumb mm -hmm. from, the, from the accelerator, you pull the brakes. Mm -hmm. Some other people, let's say there's a rabbit that passes in mm. front, crosses in front, and then uh, you get frightened. Mm. You end up making a fist like this. Oh, oh my yes. goodness. So okay. What will happen? If you get frightened with that thing, the best thing is to take off your thumb. Mm. That's the safest thing. Mm. Take off your thumb from, from the throttle and then pull the brakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, are you ready for this? As yes. ready as we ever will be. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're ready. Yeah. Right, yeah. I think we're ready. Just, you know, but our hair blew in the wind. We had so much fun. We got to really just enjoy the quad biking. Um, and I think the first question I wanted to ask you is, I love to draw parallels in life to things and the, the journeys that we go on and the adventures that we're on. And this particular adventure, I want you to kind of give us a parallel that you could draw in your head with the quad biking and the experience and the learning as a first time. Yeah. And your entrepreneurial journey and as well as you know, the transition from corporate into the crazy running of a family business. Yeah, I guess the, the first thing, it was my first time quad biking. So entrepreneurship, while it's been in the family for a long time, it was uncharted territory for me. You know, when you're going to uncharted territory, uh, which was my experience of quad biking and of course entrepreneurship, having Langini for us, <laughs> give us instructions, yes. and explain how everything works, that this is accelerated, do this, do that was kind of a parallel because I was going into unknown territory, but mm. I had to do the research. I had to equip myself with the right content in terms of understanding what are the do's and don'ts, um, you know, what to look out for. But again, you know, practically being in it is very mm. different to 
why you've been given <laughs> instructions because it, it is overwhelming. So what, what was interesting with the quad biking is that he had said, do this when you turn, don't pull your, you know, your, he, he said most people use their body. And I was like, I'll never do that. But I found myself, yes. I was trying to avoid it, but he, you know what? I was kind of using my body. So the mm. practical aspect of it and what you've been told in theory can be very different. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in those instances, you just need to be dynamic, you know, constantly being able to just maneuver and being agile. So I guess the parallel for me was the fact that I caught back for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never have gone on without having Langani brief us Absolutely. on what we needed to do, how mm -hmm. everything works. And it's the same thing with entrepreneurship. As much as I hadn't done it, I think I'd prepared myself sufficiently, mm. practically. Oh, sorry, in theory. But practically, you also need to be agile. You, you need, need to, to get dynamic. onto it. You need to get onto practice. it. practice. Exactly. Mm. You, you, you know, you think you're going to be going on a flat surface and then there we go, there's a big dip Absolutely. You know, on the road and you've got to figure out how to get through. And mm. when you're in it, you come out of it. So mm. it, it's very much, um, uh, it was, that's the parallel I kind of drew from the experience. But on, on the whole, I mean, I really enjoyed it. It was lovely. <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly. What an adventure we went on. Um, and I mean, they often say family business or getting into family business can often breed contempt. Mm. It can also often be assumed that you know, you're in the cushion of family finance and mm. you've got the cushion of family support. Um, therefore, you have it a little easier. Mm. Is that, mm. uh, you know, to a certain extent true? I feel like you've had insider information on what's been happening <laughs> behind the scenes. The hardest part about family business is actually family. Mm. The family part is the hardest part. So I'll give you an example. I think um, a part of me, you know, in understanding what the ultimate objective is of a family business is to take people along. But what I very quickly learned is that, you know, you need to run a family business the same way you'd run an own business. You've mm. got to make sure that you've got competent people, the right skill set, you know, it's professional, it's performance measured. And I actually uh, made the mistake of bringing on some people on board mm. when I got in who did not have that, that skill set or were not competent for the business. And it caused some serious chaos. And what, it's been the toughest lesson, I think, actually, in running the business is that the family part is the hardest. Um, and because there's, there's this entitlement that comes from people thinking that because it's a family business, they're entitled to work there. Yes. So I've had to really step back and put in boundaries and say, yes, you're mm. absolutely entitled to the benefits of its success. But if it has to succeed, we have to have the right people on board mm. and you are not the right person. So if I have to, you know, kind of assess the last few, few months or the last two years of what the toughest part has been in running the business is mm. actually family. Mm. And them wanting to be involved from entitlement, not because they're actually qualified to be part of it. It's, it's been mm. it's been a challenge. It really is 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 tough. It's a lot easier dealing with outsiders and strangers than yeah. you know with with no family ties. Yeah. And I think there's a whole lot of legacy and heritage that comes with taking on and running a family business, especially. Um, it's almost like you 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 in a movie <laughs> yeah. because your dad leaves you this legacy. Yeah. You know, he passes on and leaves you this legacy. It's an emotional time too, mm. because there's also grief in it. Mm. How do you manage the emotional side? And, and I mean, you are somebody who comes from corporate, mm. where you put aside your emotions and you get on with things mm. and there's performance and mm. there's KPIs, mm. but there's also an emotional side to this. Mm. Um, it's not that your dad handed you this legacy mm. over, but mm. he handed it to you and he's no more here and he trusted you to take the reins of this. Yeah. Um, so there's yeah. emotion behind it, but how do you manage the emotion too? It's actually huge emotion. It's huge emotion because, you know, when, when my dad passed away, it's, it wasn't just saying I'm gonna bury myself in work mm. because when I looked into work, work, everything about the business was him. And he was literally, you know, the, 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 the founder so everything we needed to do, I'd, I'd ask him, should we do this? And all of a sudden he was no longer there. And, you know, people always say, oh, you've got big shoes to fill. And the reality is I probably will never fill those shoes. Yeah. He was an extraordinary human being and an yeah. extraordinary entrepreneur. But what I'm grateful for is, is, is from an emotional perspective, um, the time that I'd spent with him, those 18 months, I knew that it could be maybe five or 10 years because mm. he was not well. So I really used every minute to extract the most that I could out of him. He was a challenging, very, very difficult guy. You talk about mm. a movie, have you ever watched Succession? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how I'm like, you're living it a is movie, real. you're literally living Succession. Believe me, I used to watch him be judgmental. I'm like, what type of father? Until, so I feel half the time that I'm in Succession, but the best part about it is that I had that opportunity to spend that time with him. Mm. I got to understand his vision. 
And all I can really do is put my best foot forward in achieving mm. that vision. It may be different to how he would have done it. So the, my emotions are very, I'm very pragmatic about mm. life. You know, if I'm supposed to um, get a transaction, win a transaction, and I haven't won it for whatever reason, and, and the reason is because I haven't put my best foot forward, then I'll, of course I'll be emotional about mm. it. But if I put my best foot forward, or I feel like it does not make sense, and I lose it, I'm very happy to walk away. Mm. So I think corporate for me, uh, working for, 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 for a bank specifically that had so many changes and so many strategy changes over the last few years, really taught me to be unemotional about things. Mm. Is that you have an objective. Um, for example, to when the strategy would change, the budget wouldn't change. Yeah. So when that would happen, um, I would be like, okay, fine. You want me to make this amount of money. Things have changed. You've, cha you've changed your objectives and your goalposts. I just need to find a solution to figure out how to meet the new goalposts. Absolutely. So I, I think being unemotional about the, the job aspect is, 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 is a lot easier. Mm. But the emotional part for me and the grief part is the fact that I couldn't really run away from losing him because mm. I couldn't use work as an as escape because high. he was there. Yeah. You know, he's everywhere. And what is your take on women and emotion in workspaces? Mm. You know, you, you've touched on there is an element of emotion that is there because you can't escape it. Yeah. Um, but often we're told as women to pack away the emotion and deal with things, you know, black and white when it comes mm. to the workspace. Mm. Where is the place for the emotion? Mm. And where is the place where we should not be inserting our emotions into work? Mm. It's a tough one because as much as I can say that, you know, you need to just be yourself at all times, that's not how the world works, unfortunately. So I'm not saying do not be emotional, but you have to set boundaries. So the boundaries I've always set is that I had extremely brilliant relationships with my colleagues, mm. but there was a professional relationship. Yes. So I knew the boundary of dealing with, if I'm upset about something or you've done something wrong, mm. I will call you out, mm -hmm. but I will call you out in a professional manner. Yes. I will yes. deal with aspects in a professional manner because I'm in a professional environment. It doesn't change who I am. I just know that I will not shout at a colleague the same way I'll shout at my child at home. Yes, you yes, know? So yes. it's not to say you can't express ourselves. Absolutely, we have to. Mm. Because the Yolanda you find at home is the Yolanda you find in corporate, is the Yolanda you sit across to when you're doing a transaction. But the way I would deal with, with, with certain issues and call them out, would be different mm. if it's a professional environment. In a previous interview that we did together, we spoke about the the talk, talk, talk that is often had within mm. our spaces, in the workspace, entrepreneurial space, in the um, in corporate spaces. Mm. But very often the action is lacking because we have the same issues, but we fail mm. to come together to address these issues. What do you feel are some maybe two key issues that if we bound together, especially as women, we could literally tackle and be able to address. Mm. These could be policy things, this could be just plain issues within the workspace that we have, but what, what do you feel are top two issues? Mm. If we just come together mm. and we say, cool, in tw our 2023, 2024 goal mm. is to address these top two issues mm. as women in entrepreneurship or in, in corporate. I remember when we had that conversation and it was shortly just would come out of COVID. And I will say that I think pre-COVID, what used to really agitate me is that whenever we would have Women's Day, you know, one month in the year, mm. everyone would all of a sudden start talking about these issues. You'd go into these events, you present and you look around, it's only women. And I'm like, what is the point? Why are we mm. preaching to the converted? So one thing I will say that I have found that actually post COVID, there's been a, a lot more collaboration amongst women in particular. Mm. And I think um, the urgency and the, and, and, and the aggression you know, that is coming from women is really quite commendable. And I think it's probably because, you know, when you think about the impact that COVID has had mm -hmm. on families, um, it's been so deep rooted. You know, we were chatting earlier about, uh, you know, people who were breadwinners are no longer breadwinners. So it hit us so hard that actually we had to say, listen, I'm not going to wait for a man to create a space for me to do things. Mm -hmm. There's no time. Yes. We've just got to do this and get on and mm. get on with it. So. The things that I've found I, um, really interesting, you know, over the last few months, and I keep finding myself in spaces where women are so much better at collaborating. You know, mm. I remember I said there was a fragmented, there's so many women who have the same vision, but they're so fragmented. Yes. So I, I keep finding myself in spaces where now there's much better collaboration between mm. women. So you will find like, um, let's say, I'll use an example. You have a woman who, uh, sell something mm -hmm. in the space you find yourself in that space you'll find a woman who manufactures that thing that goes towards mm. producing that and in the same way you'll find someone who provides the labor mm -hmm. for that manufacturing mm -hmm. process and in the same space you'll find someone who can do the marketing <laughs> for that so mm. i've actually really found that we've created in a very short space of time 
kind of the spiderweb effect. Yes. Where we're saying, you know what, we can do, we have the, um, the skill set, we've got the competence, you know, there's some brilliant, South Africa's got brilliant, brilliant women. Mm. And I've been so impressed by the, by, the, by the aggression in which over the last few months have just come together yes. in space and said, listen, we can create a whole a value chain, mm. you know, of whatever it is um, in this space. And you can find every part of it mm. within the space. So collaboration is one thing that I think we've been a lot better at. Um, and then the other thing, which is a big issue for me is actually financing. Yeah. I think that as women, um, sometimes we sabotage, but unfortunately, whether we like it or not, the finance or the ability to the enabling part of it is sits in the hands of a lot of men. Mm. And not just men, but also probably, you know, people, uh, uh, non-black people, should yes. I say. Yes. So that's one part I feel that if we really, you know, really collaborated better and tapped into those networks, we could actually come together and really create funding that would be available for brilliant, you know, amazing entrepreneurial, yeah. uh, entrepreneurship uh, ideas amongst women. So that's the one thing that I still think is lacking. And I can tell you that now being on this side, I used to be mm. a provider funding, being on this side of things, the banks are not going to change that environment. Yeah. Uh, government's not going to do it yeah. for us. So the <laughs> only way to do it is if we come together, we come together. as women and create mm. a network to, to, to really provide that financing for women on businesses. Absolutely. And I just want to ask as well, you're a mom of two. I am. I, I don't I know am, if anybody am, knows, but yeah, I am. I am. She's a mom of two. Um, and like, I, I, I know you look twenty something. <laughs> oh, thank you. I love you. Know, I love you a lot. I've always loved you. <laughs> and it couldn't have been easy climbing the the career ladder and raising children. Mm. What were some of the biggest challenges on that journey? Mm. And what were some of the ways in which you were literally overcoming some of these challenges, or? How did you deal with the reality of it? Mm. That this is me, yeah. this is my reality. Yeah. And listen, you know, it's either a sink or swim. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, it may sound like a bit of a cold response, but I, as I said, I'm very deliberate in every decision that I make. Therefore, when the consequence of the decisions come through, I'm like, well, I was, I'm not surprised. Mm. I, I can't be taken by surprise yes. because I made the decision knowing that this was going to be the case. So when I, when my, when I had my two children, one thing I, I can tell you that there's no such thing as balance. Mm. Not at each point in time. Yeah. Through the cycle. Yes. There's a balance. Yes. Because there'll be times where you're more, you know, focused on work. There'll be times where you're more focused on family. Yeah. But at each point in time, there's no, nothing, uh, there's no such thing as balance. So I was very open about the mm. fact that I wanted to make sure that by the time my kids have a memory mm. of our time spent together, I'm able to, to, to have that time with them. But yeah. prior to that, from the ages of, of, from when they were born to probably age four, five or six, I won't lie, I had very limited time with my children. Mm. And it's not something that most people can necessarily deal with, mm. but I had incredible support. My mom was amazing. She did the drop off and pick up. Mm. I had extremely brilliant help, you know, with with the, with my my uh, housekeeper and the nannies. But it's something that was very hard. It was not easy. I had to travel to London every other month. I'd miss them. You know, they'd be whatever eight months old. I'm away for two weeks. All I do is hug them. Mm. But it's something that I I I I knew that I had to do if I wanted to change yes. the future yes. in terms of being in a position where I now say, guys, I'm empty now, I'm taking over. Mm. I'm on a holiday, don't call me for yes. the next two weeks. Yes. I'm away with my children. Mm. But those formative years for me were very challenging. Mm. I didn't spend as much time as I would have liked to with the children because I wanted to be able to pre be present with them at a time when it really mattered. And like did you now, feel, I sit with them. Did you feel a lot of, or did you have a lot of shame thrown onto you during, the, during those times? You know, I, I, I'm sh maybe, I don't know if people thought about it, it really was not my problem. Yeah. Um, because I, I also worked in an environment where the women that I worked with um, were, were phenomenal. We supported each other. But they also made the different decisions. Mm. Like my, uh, you know, the one of the ladies I was quite close to, she decided that she's going to work till 3 p.m. Mm. But she knew that at some stage our careers would then, you know, uh, go different directions. Yes. You know, she stayed mm -hmm. and I moved ahead. Okay. But it didn't make her, she knew what I had to sacrifice. Mm. It took a lot of sacrifice. So I, I'm very pragmatic about life. I'm like, okay, mm. you can do A, B or C. If you've made C and you know what the consequence, when that happens, you know, I couldn't be, I mean, of course, I'd miss my children, mm. but I wouldn't sit and cry about it because mm. I knew that's the decision that I'd made. Yeah. But looking back, I wouldn't have done anything different because mm. 
at a time when they honestly I don't think they even remember that I was never there. And I mean, I've I, made up I, I was time. very similar, especially <laughs> with my first two. And but I remember, especially with my second one, I left work the week before I went to go give birth. Yeah. And I was with him yeah. in the boardroom, yeah. in a meeting, yeah. a week after yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. born. Yeah. So I was also that mom. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, with it's, him in the boardroom yeah. with the little other one, you know, at home with the nanny. But I was breastfeeding this one, yeah. and then yeah. you know, fully back at work. Yeah. Um, about three weeks later. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's more the shame that we give ourselves than the shame that is given upon us or others that shame us that makes us guilty. No, it, it's true. And, and, and of course, I would feel guilty when, you know, your child is not well mm. and you are in New York. Yes. And you're not going to be home, you know, you're only going to be home in three or four days' time mm. and you're dealing with a challenging client who's, oh my goodness, some yeah. of those clients were a handful. Mm. They were a hot mess. And all you want to do is go home and hug your baby. Yeah. So yeah, there were really challenging moments and difficult moments, but I always had the bigger picture in mind. I, I knew exactly what I was doing and I knew why I was doing it that way. And I, I really do believe that I've, I've, I've since made up, more than made up, <laughs> made up the last more time, than. you know? Made up the last time, exactly. And whilst we're on that tip, you're a lover of travel, especially family travel yeah. and taking your children on adventures and you know, exploring yeah. Yeah. Um, from Greece to Lake Como. Yeah. <laughs> to, you know, um, safaris. Yeah, yeah. What are some of you, the best travel experiences you've had? Or maybe let's, let's, let's talk about one. The best travel experience you've had oh, with your no, family. Oh, no, that's a tough question. <laughs> there isn't one. I mean, if, each one is so different, mm. you know. But um, I think the one, let me say the two. Please, can I just, yeah, two. Okay, the two, two that really stand mm. out for me. Um, the one was we went skiing in Zermatt in, in Switzerland. It, it was just, and it was spring skiing. Oh. None of us had gone skiing before. And it was just such an incredible time. You know, mom went with us. I always take my mom on my travels. Oh, and yes. while she wasn't skiing, <laughs> she did the walking mm. for kilometers. And really, it was just an incredible experience. All of us not knowing, we've never done this before mm. and we're trying it together. So that was, that's one that stands out. But the other one that stands out for me was probably when we did a, a drive through um, from Switzerland, we went to Germany, and we did uh, Italy, Florence, oh. Tuscany, um, the whole family, two cars, oh. driving through, going through the winelands. Oh. It was just, it was just, it was incredible. And how long was that? That went for two weeks. Oh. It was amazing. It amazing. really was amazing. So and you those, must have bonded along, like, uh, like so much along that time. We did. We bonded a lot. I learned how to drive in Italy. And I don't know if you've ever driven in Italy, but those people are not normal. <laughs> They're crazy. Little, so, little pathways. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, new things, a lot of learning. But I think for the kids, you know, I, I, I'm a believer of experiences. I, I, it's nice to have things, but yes. I don't, I'm not a believer of acquiring material, material yeah. things. Because I always say that when all is said and done, if someone took everything away from you, took mm -hmm. your house, your car, no one can ever take away that experience, that experience that you've you been had. through. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to do some rapid fire questions that I'm going to ask you. Oh my God. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? I have definitely thought about that. I think about it every single day, especially when there's no power. <laughs> but I find myself back in South Africa. Really? Yes. Hectic. Yes. True. What is your proudest accomplishment? Sure. Um, the one that's stands out is that when I was at Deutsche Bank, I, I, I started an entrepreneurial and development center, mm -hmm. which was a, a space for black owned, mm -hmm. black woman owned businesses, financial services. And my proudest moments when those companies started competing with us. Oh, wow. When we were bidding for tenders. <laughs> that was my proudest moment. And sometimes winning, winning, winning those tenders. Love I think it. for me, that is the one legacy that I'm, I'm probably proudest of. Love but my it. proudest moment, moment is still to come, by the way. Yes. Yeah. So oh. now it's, that's the one. <laughs> what was the last movie you went to and what did you think? I don't go to the movies. I oh. watch movies on the plane. I just don't okay. have time to go okay. to the movies. But the last movie I watched, I think on the plane, I was coming back from London was King Richard. Ooh, which okay. was going against what I'd said after the whole debacle with, <laughs> with, um, <laughs> with Will Smith. But anyways, uh, I love tennis. I mm -hmm. love the Williams sisters. It was a brilliant movie. I didn't think they captured the greatness mm -hmm. um, the way one would, but you can't capture it in an you hour can't. and a half. Yeah. But what it did, did show us is that, you know, to be extraordinary, you have to do extraordinary things. And yeah. I think what the father did to achieve that and the things that they had to sacrifice and give up. Mm. Really, I think for my for my son who loves football, I made him watch it with me mm. because I thought if you really want to do well and you, you must understand what, what sacrifice you need to make mm. and what sacrifice I would need to make. Yes. So I absolutely loved it. What do your children want to be when they grow up? Okay, it depends who's asking. 
<laughs> if I ask, because I said to them, you can just chase your dreams but be yes. financially independent, <laughs> the answer is very different. So when I ask, Tori says, Mom, I want to be a uh, footballer if being a robotics engineer does not work out. <laughs> but when someone else asks, he says he wants to be a robotic engineer if football does not work out. So he definitely wants to be a footballer. My daughter, if I ask her, she wants to be a surgeon. I absolutely don't believe her for one second. There's nothing surgeon in her. I actually think she wants to be in design, anything artistic. Okay. Clothing design, okay. interior design. She's very artistic. Okay. If you listen to any radio, what's a, what's your top two radio stations um, that you listen to the most in your car? Um, I only listen to two, actually. In the okay. mornings, absolutely always 947, mm -hmm. because I love the quiz. Yes. We do the quiz when I drop off ah. uh, with the kids. And um, lunchtime, depending on how depressed and your headlines are, I normally listen to 702. Okay. Always, lunchtime, yeah. Would you sing at karaoke and what song is the number one song you would sing at karaoke? <laughs> oh my God, I only sing one song at karaoke and it always works out. It's my one trick pony. I don't even know if you'll know it. It's from Greece. Footloose. Uh, no, no, no. no? It's, it's, it's hopelessly devoted to you. It's a slow oh, okay. song. okay. The slow song. It's the okay. only song I can sing. It's the only song that really makes people think I can sing and okay. I really can Oh, no. Sing. Footloose is on Footloose. It's Footloose, Greece, yeah. Greece, Greece is... Greece is... Like a good Greece like Greece like Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. Hopelessly, hopelessly devoted to you by Olivia Newton-John. She's not late, but that's okay. the only song I can sing. What is your favorite thing about your career and why? My career was when I was in banking. Okay. Now, no, no, no. Now the now, property now. entrepreneurship because it is right in the heart of the economy. Okay. You know, when you've developed a site and built it, mm -hmm. it's bricks and mortar, you can touch and feel it. Mm -hmm. It's not imaginary, it's not financial, it's not stock market, yes. stock up, stock down, with no real impact. Um, so it's, it's, it's real. Like you actually have brick and mortar I and there's people the building, inside. There are people working, there are people who are employed. Mm. So that satisfaction of actually creating something that was mm. not there, going from, you know, plain, property, yes. nothing, getting zoning rights, getting develop, developing yes. and architectural, and then it's there and you touch it. I think that's what I love so much about property as well. It's yeah. like, it's gone from like 100 rand yeah. to 50,000, just by putting yeah. the one, two, three, four things here. Correct, but, and, and that's one thing I never appreciate is that if it was, if it's that straightforward, why aren't more enough people doing it mm -hmm. until I got to the background of getting it to from that 100 to, to actually put up a structure. Mm. The red tape in this yes, country is a lot. unbelievable. Mm. The zoning process that's supposed yeah. to take 12 months, they take three yeah. years. So when you get to understand that what you need to do to mm. get it into that form, then you start appreciating why you, the value why appreciation is, comes through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Would you rather win the lottery or work at the perfect job? <laughs> An easy one. Of course, work at the perfect job. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Well, why? Well, I mean, look, the lottery, you can sit at home and no, just like live no, and... No, no, <laughs> no. You have to wake up. Something has to drive you every day, mm. every morning. You know, mm. for me, I, money is an, able, is an enabler. I think I, I shared this with you before, is that I, I can't be... You know, the reality is that we need money to get things done. Mm -hmm. But it's only that. It's an enabler. Yes. So it, watching it, sitting it in your bank account does not give me joy. But doing something that gives me purpose on a daily basis, knowing that I'm doing a job, because I always try to be impactful in whatever job that I do, mm. I, I'm serving my purpose. And in the process, making money that mm. I, will enable me to do the things that I need to do uh, is a lot more, is a lot more um, satisfactory, much more. And what is the number one gift or the best gift you've ever received? Does it have to be material or can I be a little bit philosophical? It can be philosophical. Okay, that, that's my vibe. <laughs> I'm a very deep thinker. So for me, no doubt, um, the power of the word that my mom taught me when I was mm. seven years old. I, 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 I was born again when I was seven years old. I discovered the word of God. Mm -hmm. I discovered how to apply it. I discovered how to use it. Mm -hmm. So I, when all is said and done, you know, you go to the right schools, you study the right stuff, you work hard, blood, sweat and tears, sacrifice a lot. Mm -hmm. You can do all of that yeah. and end up nowhere. Absolutely. For me, I truly believe that everything that I, I have, everything that I've impacted people with, everything I've gifted, everything I've, I'm yet to create has come from the, my ability to be guided and to believe in the word of mm. God. So that's the most powerful gift that 
my mom ever gave me. And it's, it's served me incredibly well. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Trisha, what an amazing thank you for interview. Me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of She's Driven, where we explored Yolanda Mia, the shift from corporate finance into entrepreneurship, running a family business, running a legacy and a heritage that stretches decades. What does that take? Whew. What an impactful episode where I hope you've learned also, should you be transitioning, should you be going through a career pivot, there are so many gems here. Until the next time.